Hi and welcome to the Apollo Saturn V Center at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex. I'm Bethany Hall and we are about to explore a pivotal moment in American history where humans left Earth from Cape Kennedy and set off to stand on another world. Every astronaut that stepped foot on the moon launched atop a Saturn V rocket like the one you see behind me. This Saturn V is only one of three remaining Saturn V rockets in the United States. The Saturn V is divided into three stages. If you look up, you will see the first stage of the Saturn V rocket. Five F-1 engines consumed 534,000 gallons of fuel in 168 seconds to propel the rocket. By the time the rocket was 40 miles in the air, it was traveling at an incredible 5,000 miles per hour. To give you an idea of how much power that really is, the rocket produced 7.6 million pounds of thrust. That's more than 85 Hoover dams. To, to deliver fuel rapidly to the rocket, turbo pumps had to be designed that could deliver the fuel at an incredible pace. And here's a spin-off bonus. Those turbo pumps were the precursor to a lot of technology you see in today's artificial hearts. But we're here to talk about the astronauts that chose to propel themselves to the moon in the command module atop this rocket. If you'll come with me to my left, you will see the Apollo Command and Service Module. It's divided into two sections. The first, cone-shaped section, is where the astronauts would ride. It's the command module. It's 10 feet, 7 inches tall, and just shy of 13 feet in diameter, a small space by any stretch for the three astronauts making the three-day, quarter-million-mile trip to the moon. The second, cylinder-shaped section is the service module. It contains the electrical power and propulsion for the command module. It also had space for consumables, like food and water, that the astronauts would need on their journey. Prior to re-entry, the, the command module would separate from the service module, and the service module would burn up in the atmosphere, while the command module would prepare for splashdown in the ocean, safely bringing our astronauts home. NASA launched 19 of these throughout the course of the Apollo program, but only nine transported humans to the moon. In a moment, you will get to see the command module from the Apollo 14 mission. But first, I'm going to send you to Joshua Sansora for a closer look at the second stage. Joshua? We're now here alongside the Saturn V rocket at the top of the first stage and the bottom of the second stage. That second stage uses five J-2 engines to produce about a million pounds of thrust to propel the rocket through the uppermost part of Earth's atmosphere. Wow, this thing is huge. To this day, it's still the tallest rocket to ever fly. At about 363 feet tall, that's about 60 feet taller than the Statue of Liberty. Because this rocket and this exhibit are so massive, we wanted to show you this scale model to give you a little bit better perspective of how big this thing is. So the bottom up to here is the first stage, and then from there to here is the second stage. We have the third stage, the lunar lander, and then the capsule where the astronauts would ultimately sit. So again, even a scale model is so enormous. Uh, while the first stage of the Saturn V rocket was used to mostly get the rocket off the ground, uh, which it did great, it actually would run out of fuel at about 42 miles in altitude. At that point, that first stage would separate and fall back to Earth and land in the ocean. Then the second stage engines would light, and that would carry the rocket into Earth orbit. And then once its fuel was expended, it would separate and fall back to Earth as well. That third stage down there would be used to mostly get us from Earth orbit to Moon orbit. Once in orbit around the moon, for Apollo 11, astronauts Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin flew the lunar lander and actually landed on the surface of the moon. On that lander was a plaque that read, We come in peace for all mankind. Indeed, this was a historic moment for America, but this was also a moment of global inspiration and unity as over 600 million people tuned in to watch those first steps on the moon on television. For a brief moment, the world was united in, uh, in, in unity together in its celebration of this historic achievement for all mankind. Um, one of the things that made the Apollo program so incredible is that it started in 1963. We were in full swing with the Gemini program and we were just winding down Project Mercury. We were building rockets of vastly different sizes, constructing the enormous vehicle assembly building. We're creating these giant launch pads and we're training crews to do things that nobody's ever done before. Uh, it really is this moment where when we land on the moon where it's this culmination of just an incredible journey. And Neil and Buzz both recognized that it really was an accomplishment for all mankind. 
Just around the corner over there, there's actually a number of headlines, copies of headlines from around the world from back in 1969 capturing those first few steps on the moon. Can you imagine what the headlines will say on our next giant leap in space exploration? What will they say when we walk on the moon again? How about walking on the Mars? What will those headlines say? Back in 1969, 50 years ago, we were still 14 years from the first time that an American woman would fly into space. And we've made no mystery that women will be there for the next giant leaps in space exploration. Could you be a part of one of those headlines? We want to show you some artifacts from the Apollo program now, and Bethany's actually found some of those in our vault over here. Welcome to the vault. There are a lot of artifacts in this room. Too many to go into everything today, but I did want to highlight a few major items for you as you look around. If you look over here, you will see the command module for the Apollo 14 mission, nicknamed Kitty Hawk. The Apollo 14 crew had some trouble docking with the lunar module Antares. It took the crew six attempts before a hard dock was achieved, and that's not the only problem they encountered. During a test, a short in the lunar module's abort switch was discovered. If triggered, this would have caused an abort during the lunar module's descent. Despite all this, Antares made the most precise landing to date, coming in only 87 feet from their planned target in the Frau Mora region of the moon. The Apollo 14 capsule brought back with it 94 pounds of lunar rock and soil. This was scheduled to go to 187 scientific teams in the United States and 14 other countries for study and analysis. If you look over here, you will see a sample of the lunar rock from the Apollo 15 mission. This is believed to be 3.7 billion years old. Now come with me, we're gonna take a look at some spacesuits along the wall. If you'll come over here, you will see a wall of spacesuits. The spacesuit is a complex modern armor that the astronauts have to wear to, to explore space. The astronaut, Apollo suits, I'm sorry, had to do things the Mercury and Gemini suits could not. They had to enable astronauts to walk on the moon. The astronauts had to be able to traverse rocky terrain, and they had to be able to walk away from the lunar lander. And here's a fun fact, if you're wearing athletic shoes, chances are you are walking on Apollo spin-off technology. Much of the spacesuit technology is used in the external shell of athletic shoes, and also in the fabrication process. If you'll look over here, you will see Alan Shepard's spacesuit, still covered in lunar dust. And that's, these spacesuits serve as a reminder that spaceflight is not without risk. Next, we're going back to Joshua, who's in the Apollo 1 Tribute. We're here now at the Apollo 1 Tribute. And as you walk in, there's a sign that reads, Ad Astra Paraspera. That is a Latin phrase that means, a rough road leads to the stars. The Apollo program began with the loss of an entire crew. It really was a rough road that led to the moon. On January 27, 1967, during a pre-flight test in preparation for Apollo 1, a fire broke out on the command module, and they were unable to open the hatch, and the entire crew was trapped inside. Astronauts Virgil, Gus Grissom, Edward White, and Roger Chaffee lost their lives that day. They were scheduled to fly just a few weeks later on February 21st, 1967. And here you can actually see these are the, the hatch elements uh, to that command module. This is what, they, what failed during that pre-launch test. Because of that failure, there was a redesign effort done to create an entirely new design, which you can see over here. And that redesign was made so that it could be opened in five seconds compared to 90 seconds for the old hatch. This display ultimately serves as a reminder of the tremendous effort made to improve and increase safety uh, for our crews and for the entire program. After the accident, NASA spent time slowing things down and looking at every single piece of that rocket and spacecraft. As a result, there were a number of things that were, were changed to improve safety and allowed us to successfully land with 12 men on the surface of the moon during that Apollo program. It can be easy and it's appropriate to think of these men as, as astronauts and icons and heroes, but these three men, they were just that. They were men, they were sons and brothers and husbands and fathers. To their kids, they were just dad. Gus, he loved engineering and he was actively involved in the work done on his own aircraft and spacecraft. He also loved to fish and he loved cars. 
Ed was an amazing athlete. His event was the 400 meter hurdles, and he actually almost made the Olympic team. Roger was known for taking special care with everything that he did. And he also loved sport shooting, and he loved to cook. If you could ask these guys any question, what would you ask them? Later, Michael Collins, the command module pilot for Apollo 11, reflected on their sacrifice, and he said this. Apollo 1 tragically cost three lives, but I think it saved more than three lives later. Without it, very likely, we would have not landed on the moon by the end of the decade. These three brave individuals gave their lives in pursuit of space exploration, and their sacrifice led to further testing and redesign that enabled us to successfully accomplish the charge given by President Kennedy back in 1961. And that charge was that we should safely land a man on the moon and bring him home safely before the end of the decade. We call this space a tribute because a tribute reminds us of what these men made possible. All right, so I am here now with uh, four-time space shuttle astronaut and current center director for the Kennedy Space Center, Bob Cabana. Thanks, Bob, for joining us. Oh, my pleasure, Josh. So we just came from the Apollo 1 tribute, mm -hmm. and, and the question I want to start with is to kind of just ask, how do we deal with that? How do we kind of engage with that topic, the idea of losing crew mm -hmm. 52 years later? And we've had a couple losses since then. So how, as we move forward in time, do we make sense of that? Well, uh, first off, Josh, uh, what we're doing is not without risk. Anything worth doing is not without risk. And sure. as, a, as a midshipman at the Naval Academy, I had to memorize all these famous naval sayings. And uh, John Paul Jones had one, and it was, he who will not risk cannot win. Mm. So you have to take a little risk in order to succeed. It's something great. And going to the moon was phenomenal. When you think back on uh, the challenge that uh, President Kennedy gave our nation back then, you know, we hadn't, we'd just flown a suborbital flight. And he said, I want you on the moon within this decade. Eight years later, yeah. And eight and a half years later, we're walking on the moon. That was amazing. So when I look back on it, first off, it was awful that we lost that crew. Um, American heroes, all. Just great guys. But we learned from it, all right? The spacecraft was better because of it. We made it to the moon because of Apollo 1. Yeah. All that they learned from that accident. Unfortunately, we tend to have to relearn our, our mistakes in the past. And what it really comes down to is, on something like this, it's the necessity to have configuration management, to have control of the process, to make sure that you do all the testing, and that everybody has a voice in the decisions that are made, that all the information is brought to the decision maker so he can make an informed decision, and that we don't become accustomed to things not being right. Well, this wasn't right, but nothing bad happened. Yeah. All right? And, such, such a good point. And, and so you always have to be on the lookout for, you know, what's not right, what is the impact of it, and then if you can try and think of everything that can possibly go wrong. When we were training to fly in space, we had this guy, he was called the sim soup, the simulation supervisor, right? And it was his job to challenge the crew in the mission control team doing integrated simulations. And they came up with scenarios that were just unbelievable. But <laughs> they, they tried to think of every possible thing that could go wrong during a mission. And then they piled them up. You know, but it was forcing the crew and the team to work together to solve the problems. Uh, unfortunately, we lost the Apollo 1 crew. And I'm really proud of the exhibit that you showed everybody. Uh, how we remember those guys is really important that we don't forget. Uh, the same with Challenger in Columbia. So going forward, the, the thing is, you can't let something like that stop you. If it's really worth doing, you know, you, you have to persevere and, and charge on. And the true measure of a person isn't the mistakes that he or she makes, it's how do they respond to them. Do they let them bring them down and, yeah. and mire them in the muck? Yeah. Or do they rise above them and go on? So that's awesome. Yeah, and I think that that's a really good way to kind of like wrap up that thought of saying we, we move on not forgetting them, but kind of just to honor them. And that's yeah. kind of what we, we mentioned there is just that the tribute is there to remind us of what they made possible. Absolutely. Um, and so I don't want to kind of lose the other point you kind hey. of just hit on of like, hey, we, we went on to do some really amazing things and we continue to do amazing things. Absolutely. So I want you to kind of explain where we are now because this is a really neat spot. So this is 
all the control panels and systems that were in the launch control center in the firing room. These are the actual consoles? These are, yeah. These are the. This, this is historical. And, and it's set up exactly as it was when we launched Apollo to the moon. And that was so darn cool. I, I had the privilege of seeing an Apollo launch. Which, which I did not get the chance to do. I'm a little I, bit jealous. I, I was uh, a midshipman at the Naval Academy and the Physics Honor Society came down to KSC in April of 1970, that spring, to see Apollo 13 launch. And there's another, uh, we triumphed over adversity. Man, right? Yeah. The team came together and uh, were able to, to make that work and save that crew. But it, it was awesome. And I remember being in the vehicle assembly building and seeing these Saturn V rockets being stacked up to go to the moon and watching that big Saturn V take off. You know, that's what, that's what really planted the spark in me that said, maybe I could do this. Jim Lovell was a Naval Academy graduate. He was a Naval aviator and a test pilot and an astronaut. Maybe I could do that when I graduate. I just wanted to fly airplanes, but one thing kind of led to another. Sure, and so this spot specifically, we're at the Kennedy Space Center, the Apollo Saturn V Center. Mm -hmm. So people can actually come and get to see this. Um, kind of what you see on the other side over here is actually kind of a, a standing area. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some seating as well, where if you come through this building, you get to come in and kind of see a cool, it's kind of a, a mock what? recap of what a launch simulation Ab looks like. Absolutely. They, well, it's not just a launch simulation. It's, it's the uh, Apollo 8 mission to the moon, yeah. the first one to the moon. And they run through and they're talking and the consoles light up and they actually play the, the footage and sound that was, you, you don't see people, but you hear all the sounds that from the voice loops as we launched that mission. Which is cool to get to hear that historical content. Oh, absolutely. And so, as we kind of think about the history of this place, very, th there's a more modern look to them, but we're in the process now of preparing consoles very similarly to move on to the future. So, I wish, you, you know, okay, you're going to have to do this again. We're going to take them over <laughs> to Firing Room 1 and show them what it looks like. Because hey, from Firing Room 1 in the Launch Control Center, we're going to launch the next man and the first woman to go to the moon in 2024. And it's going to be awesome. And what's really cool, the launch director, NASA's yes. first female launch director. So, Charlie Blackwell Thompson is going to be the one that says go. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you this question because I did some homework and I couldn't find out the real answer. All right. But is she the first female launch director, period? Because yeah. I couldn't find another female no, launch absolutely, director absolutely. anywhere. Charlie's the first one. So it doesn't matter if it's NASA or not. It's all been men before. Which well, is awesome. I, no, okay, I, I can't speak for other countries, but I don't know of any. But, but for NASA, she is the definitely the first one. Okay, cool. So kind of uh, what's... Uh, What's coming up? So you say 2024. Right. So what, give me a, a kind of a, an overview of like how do we get to 2024? So here's the plan right now. Um, we were trying to get to the moon, right? Send folks back and build this gateway, this uh, docking station, if you will, this uh, waypoint on the way to getting to the lunar surface. So that's what we're going to do, but we've accelerated it. So the plan now is we're going to fly the first test flight of SLS and Orion, the space launch system. It's this big rocket that's uh, not quite as big as a Saturn V with the Orion spacecraft, which holds four astronauts instead of three like Apollo. And we're going to go around the moon without a crew, all right? And we're shooting for that end of 2020, early 21. And then in 2022, we're going to fly Orion again, this time with the crew on board to the moon, but they're not going to land. And then the plan is in 2024, we're actually going to send humans, Americans, back to the moon. And uh, we'll get that first woman on the moon. And that first, the, the vice president told us the next, next people to go to the moon, they're going to be Americans. It's going to be the next man and the first woman to set foot on the moon. So in order to do that, we're building this uh, gateway, this docking station around the moon. And right. we've already let the contract for the power propulsion element that's going to power this thing. And then it's going to have, mm, we're still defining exactly the first <laughs> sure. stages. It's going to be a little smaller than when it starts out. There's going to be a phase one, and it'll have a, a habitability utilization module, and it'll have a, a, a lander attached to it. So Orion will dock with this, and then they'll get in the lander and uh, be able to go down to the lunar surface and back again. And what's cool about the gateway is that it's in an orbit with this power propulsion element that allows access to anywhere on the lunar surface. So this time when we go back to the moon, we're not just going for a 
two or three day camping trip. Right. We're going to stay. We're setting up sustainable operations and that's really key. So from phase one, we'll go to phase two. We'll have more elements and more science will be Robots, able to be done. Robots, habitats, you got lots, it. Of, lots of cool stuff. So the thing is, we're not going alone. We're going with our commercial partners and with our international partners. And this program, this is really cool, it's called Artemis, the twin sister of Apollo. Her Which name is cool was Artemis, yeah. all right? And so going back to the moon, the program, it's no longer Apollo. Now we have the Artemis program. And what we want to create is the Artemis generation. You know, think about the population of the world. Uh, half the world wasn't even born when we went to the moon. And, you know, we have a whole new generation that we need to, uh, to excite and, and stimulate that interest in science and technology and math and be able to, you know, just do all the great things that our nation does with a whole new generation. I, I think it's going to be inspiring. So. Yeah. I want to see the Artemis generation excited about going back to the yeah. moon. And, and this is the stepping stone that's going to get us to Mars. All the systems, what we learn, how to operate away from planet Earth in that harsh void of space for extended periods of time, having reliable systems to keep crews alive, it's going to be awesome. So we want to kind of speak to the Artemis generation. Absolutely. Um, we asked them to send us some questions, and they did. And we're going to come to Bethany in just a second. But the first one, we got this several times. And right. so I wanted to pose it to you. It's a little bit of a hard question. Sure. But you seem to like those. <laughs> um, so the, the question came in, <clears throat> what do, how do you respond to people who say, we're not going to make 2024? Like, we can't do it. Like, <laughs> well, how, we can do it. If we have the, the, uh, the national resolve and the, uh, and the funding to make it happen, we, we can do it. You know, um, this NASA team, and I know specifically this team at KFC, if, if you provide them with the resources and point them in the right direction, they can make anything happen. So we can do this. And you know, even if it's towards the end of 2024 into early 25, we're going to do it. We can make this happen. We have the ability and the technology. We just need to ensure that we get the, uh, the funding and, and press ahead. And, and we're moving full speed. We're doing things a lot quicker with our procurements, the type of procurements that we're using, how we're part with industry and commercial space, we can do this. Yeah, we don't have time to get into that today, but I think it's really interesting if you do some homework on the partnerships of NASA, we're operating so much differently than we did Absolutely. even 10 years ago. Absolutely. But let's go ahead and take some questions now. I know that there's probably some viewers that are anxious to hear their questions asked. What did it feel like to float in space for the first time? Oh gosh, I wish I, wish I could take like a five or six year old up in space with me. <laughs> because that's what I felt like. It is so cool to be weightless in space. Um, it's just, it's effortless. Um, now, I will admit, some folks get what's called SAS, space adaptation <laughs> syndrome. That seems like a really polite way to say that it's, they get not, nauseous. it's not super happy. Yeah, they get an upset stomach and they don't feel real good, all right? But uh, everybody adapts to zero G within about you know, 12 to 24 hours. And, and we have medications that we can take to calm that nausea. But it is so fun. It's just effortless. Um, you know, and what's really cool is long-time flyers and short-term flyers, you can tell the difference. I, I flew with uh, <laughs> Sergei Kriklov and uh, my Russian crewmate on my last flight. And Sergei, at that time, had more time and space than any other human in the world, right? And to watch him move through the space station and through the shuttle. It was just, it was effortless. It was like poetry in motion, like watching ballet. He was, he was that cool as he floated uh, through space. And we do stupid astronaut tricks, play with our food and all that stuff. <laughs> well, that's what I tell people when they talk about astronauts in space. I'm like, they're just big kids. Like, Absolutely. Watch them at mealtime, they're like throwing food around. Um, it's, it's no, no, like a we don't time. throw food. No, we... Sorry, wrong term, wrong no, term. We might float food float <laughs> to a friend or whatever, but we don't throw it. Okay, that's, that's important, I guess. There's no food fights in space? No, no, it's just a unique way of passing the food. I got you. You know, you don't hand somebody a tray. You just, can I have that? Sure. And you just touch it like that and it just slowly floats over. Awesome, very cool. Let's take another question. You mentioned poetry, and we had a question that Astronaut Collins has said the next astronaut should be a poet. What do you think of that? Uh, I, you know, I think there's a little bit of poet in all of us. Uh, Al Warden flew uh, on Apollo and went to the moon. He was in the command module up on, uh, you know, orbiting the moon while the rest of the crew was down on the lunar surface. But Al, Al writes poetry. And uh, I can't think of the name of it right now, but 
he's got an awesome poem about going to the moon. And I, I think, uh, you know, someday uh, space is going to be open to, uh, to everybody. We've got a ways to go to make that happen. But I believe that all of us shouldn't focus on just any one thing, all right? Uh, I, I was a math major in, uh, in college, and I've got a lot of engineering and aerospace engineering in order to be a test pilot and an astronaut. But I, I also love to read. I love the humanities. Uh, I love music. So y you can't, you have to be open to everything. So I want to ask you a question, kind of thinking about the future and mm -hmm. um, on a technical, maybe technical, maybe not technical, but what are some of the biggest challenges that, that we kind of face moving forward? Thinking about just human exploration, like, because well, we're, we're so much smarter than we were when we were flying shuttle, sure. flying Apollo. So where do the challenges lie ahead? We still have a lot of challenges in front of us. I, I, the biggest challenge for us as we leave planet Earth for extended periods of time is getting outside the uh, radiation belt that protects the uh, magnetosphere. That yeah, the Van Allen belt. The, that, yeah. that protects the Earth from uh, radiation. Um, radiation is going to be huge as we go to Mars, uh, as we stay on the moon for extended periods of time. We're going to have to have some way to protect the crew from the uh, higher radiation that we have there. You know, we still have, uh, we need to have a better understanding of the impacts of extended stays in microgravity on the human system. Uh, Scott Kelly, of course, was in space for a year. You know, we've learned now that uh, on some astronauts, especially on longer duration flights, there's uh, impact to the optical nerve, edema. There's a swelling right. uh, that can impact vision. And it may or may not be permanent. So, you know, there's, there's still a lot to learn about how we keep this human system alive uh, in that microgravity, that harsh void of space. Sure, sure. Let's take another question. How did your perspective change when looking down at Earth? Oh, gosh. So, you know, I'd, I'd seen the Earth from an airplane, from 40,000 feet. It looks pretty cool. And I wish I would have had the view that the Apollo astronauts had, you know, <laughs> that blue marble floating in that black void of space. But on the space shuttle, when you're up about, you know, 220 nautical miles above the Earth, I mean, you see the curvature of the Earth. And you can see over 1,500 miles in any one direction. And you see that harsh black void of space. And, and there's this thin little hazy line over the Earth. And, and that's our atmosphere. That's, that's all that's protecting us from the, that harsh void with its ultraviolet radiation, with its extreme temperatures. And it, it actually looks a little bit fragile. But when you look down on the Earth, you, you don't see the, there's a couple places where you can see boundaries uh, of countries. But mostly, you just see this one planet. And one, one continent, you know, you, you look at continents, you don't see countries. You see the green of the tropics, the blue of the oceans. You see the deserts are just, you know, it, it, it just, the earth is absolutely beautiful. And I think it made me more aware that, hey, you know, this is, this is spaceship earth. We're all on it, right. <laughs> traveling around, uh, you know, our sun. There's nowhere else to go. We need to take care of it. And, it, and you can see the impacts of humans on, on our Earth from space. Uh, you know, uh, the rainforest in Brazil with the cutting of the trees and the burning. And, you know, you see all kinds of things from space that you get a more global perspective. It, it's not just us in our one place, but uh, we all have to work together to take care of this sure. beautiful planet that we're on. Do you ever find yourself, now that you're back on Earth, do you ever find yourself looking at things and asking, I wonder what that would look like from space. No, I, I never have. I, I never thought of that. But I'll tell you, any time I had a spare minute on orbit, my nose was up to the window watching the Earth go by. It, it's just amazing. And I have, a, I have a memory from each one of those missions that I tried to plant in my brain. That, that's the other thing. I, pictures just don't do it justice. What, what you see with the eyes that God gave you is so much better. I, I remember after my first flight, I, went to, I was at the Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C., and the IMAX movie, The Blue Planet, had just come out. And I'm watching this, uh, you know, on this IMAX screen, and it shows up, and I see the Earth, and I said, that's what it, no, it looks better than that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Getting closer, but never quite there. Yeah. Do we have any more questions? We had one more. I heard there was a special song you took to the station which reminded you of your daughter. Can you share the story and how important things like songs are to you when you are in space? Absolutely. So. 
uh, I'm going to digress a minute. When you ask about things we have to deal with, I talked about the physical aspects, but there's also the psychological aspect of being isolated uh, on long distance traveling in space. And so the things that we do on Earth that help us, you know, they apply to space also. I love music, uh, all kinds of music, and I love listening to music. Um, I wish I were a better uh, musician. <laughs> I used to play the trombone when I was growing up. Kind of put that aside. And I've, <laughs> I've tried to play the guitar, but I'm not that great. <laughs> and I, I got through book one of learning how to play the piano. I, we, we owned a piano. I said, if we're going to have it in the house, I'm going to learn how to play it. But uh, <laughs> I would like to get better. Absolutely. But music's important. Reading's important. All the things that we do on Earth for entertainment, uh, you know, we can do in space. And with the advent of e-books, you know, you don't have to worry about all this paper and weight that you're taking along. You can take along all kinds of stuff. So my daughter and I are real Wizard of Oz aficionados, uh, you know, as she was growing up. And right before my last flight, before I went in quarantine, they had re-released the movie, The Wizard of Oz, to the theaters, all color corrected and everything. And so she and I went to see it. And uh, it, it was awesome. So the first night that we went out to launch, it, the weather was just bad. I mean, it was rain and thunderstorms and stuff, and, and things just weren't going right. And uh, we, we were gonna launch anyway. We, the, things kind of came together, and with the space station, when you're going up to do a rendezvous with something else, you only have like a five minute launch window. You gotta get off or you're not going. Right. So we had a problem getting one of the APUs started, auxiliary power units that provide uh, hydraulic uh, pressure to gimbal the engines and move the flight control surfaces. And they, we went into a hold at, uh, we counted down to 18 seconds, basically, oh, and didn't man. go. Oh, All right? So close. We, we had waited so long before we uh, came out of the five-minute hold to go that when they sorted things out, they, uh, they said, you don't have enough propellant to rendezvous with the space station. And, and it was okay. Um, we went back to crew quarters, and uh, we tried it again the next day. So that next morning, there was this picture in the paper of Endeavor sitting on the pad with this rainbow over it, right? And that night we went out, and it was the smoothest launch count I've ever seen. And, and we launched, and we got to orbit, and everything was just going perfect. So the wake-up music on the, on the first day was uh, Judy Garland singing Somewhere Over the Rainbow. And man, I had tears going down my eyes. It just, it just emotionally grabbed me. And uh, my daughter had made sure that that was the music that was played. So I always tell folks, uh, somewhere over the rainbow, dreams come true, because we launched over that rainbow and we had an absolutely dream flight from start to finish. Awesome. So kind of wrapping up here, um, so we wanted to kind of pick this spot mm -hmm. to, to be here today just because most people probably don't know about kind of how roles and responsibilities are divided amongst the NASA centers. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to things like rockets, like we don't really build rockets here. That's not KSC's thing. No. Uh, but we're the best in the world at launching rockets. Absolutely. And that's what these firing rooms are about. Um, so obviously, you mentioned earlier getting ready for that, um, firing, firing rockets into space, getting them where they need to be um, through lots of our programs. Absolutely. And I, remember I talked about simulations? Yes. Right now. Charlie Blackwell Thompson's running launch simulations over in firing room one, preparing for that first launch of uh, SLS and Orion. We're going to be ready when the time comes. That's right. So they've got their team set up in rooms similar to this, much more modern looking. Absolutely. Running through countdowns, working out the kinks. Because you have to write a countdown before you can do a countdown, <laughs> which is a challenge. And you have to know all the systems on the vehicle and have all the procedures and all the software. So a lot of work goes, in, goes into launching a rocket. That's right. Yeah. So. Thinking about the next year, mm -hmm. next 12 months, yep. what should our viewers be really looking for? What's the, what's the exciting stuff for oh. the Kennedy Space Center? So uh, first off, coming up here on July 2nd, we're going to do an in-flight abort test of the Orion capsule here at the Cape. And uh, it tests that uh, big uh, solid rocket motor that's on top that lifts the capsule off of the rocket in case of a, a problem with the rocket to get the crew safely back down. So that's going to be a huge test coming up. Um, I really want to see crews flying to the International Space Station on a U.S. rocket from U.S. soil by the end of this year. Yeah. So we have Boeing and SpaceX. They're working very hard to uh, help make that happen. Uh, SpaceX has already had an uncrewed demonstration flight of their Dragon capsule docking with the space station. Uh, Boeing is going to be flying an uncrewed flight, 
hopefully in the August time frame, we'll see if they stay on track. Uh, and then hopefully by the end of the year, early next year, both of them will be flying crews to the International Space Station on a test flight. So that's going to be very important. Uh, and then by the end of this year, uh, we're going to have all the construction and testing of all the facilities necessary to process and launch the space launch system in Orion complete here at KSC. We still have uh, some software to develop. There's a lot of processes that, that we're going to be going through right. where we're testing with non-flight hardware, stacking things up and making sure things are right with the equipment that we've built. But uh, come next year in uh, 2020, we're going to have flight hardware down here processing it and getting it stacked up to uh, launch into space on SLS. And that's going to be pretty darn cool. That's, that's an amazing rocket. It's, uh, it's going to so, be fun. So just real quick. Yeah, please. The space shuttle had uh, three main engines, and they're liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen engines. Hydrogen's the fuel, oxygen's the oxidizer. The external tank on the, on the space shuttle is the same diameter as the space launch system. Okay. So that extra, the big orange tank. Right, right. That big orange tank. That's just the size of the hydrogen tank. So on top of that, <laughs> there's a liquid oxygen tank. Okay. There's a second stage on top of that. And then there's a command and service module on top of that. And then those solid rocket motors that the shuttle had. Right. We're using those on the uh, SLS also. But the space shuttle had four segments stacked up. This has got five segments. It's got another huge segment of solid rocket motor propellant stacked up on it. And then the shuttle had three of those uh, shuttle main engines. Right. We're using those for SLS also. It's called the RS-25. We've got new engine controllers. We've modified them a little bit. It's going to have four of those engines down on the bottom. So the space shuttle was pretty darn awesome when it took off. It, it was. was loud it and was. fast. All right. <laughs> so this has got four shuttle engines, bigger solid rocket motors. It's going to be amazing when it launches. Yeah, we're all eager for that. So final word from you, Bob, thinking about our viewers here, thinking about the future of human space exploration. What do you want to leave our viewer with? We have an absolutely awesome future, Josh. Our nation is a world leader in space, and we're going to continue to lead. The Artemis program taking us back to the moon is awesome, and that's a stepping stone to go into Mars. Uh, the future is really bright, and I would challenge everybody out there to get involved. Uh, if you have a dream, go for it. Don't give up. Be persistent. Work hard. You know, I, I never dreamed I'd be an astronaut. I talked about that a little bit, but one thing kind of led to another. Being a, a pilot allowed me to become a test pilot, which allowed me to become an astronaut. And uh, I'd say work hard and do your best at everything you do and, and don't ever give up. Um, yeah. Not even the sky is the limit. I learned that. Absolutely. So uh, thank you for, for tuning in. Thanks, Bethany, for all your help, and Mr. Cabana for joining us as well. Thanks a lot, Josh. Appreciate you. you we'll bet. see you next time. Bye.